Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the KESG conference. But first of all, what is KESG? Uh, that's um, KAIST Entrepreneurship, Sustainability, and Green Business Conference. Uh, these are the key words uh, we pay special attention to uh, in terms of our research in education here at KAIST College of Business. Uh, and they are the key words uh, we'll talk a lot today with the distinguished speakers, uh, discussants, session chairs, and guests. I'd like to thank all participants for being here to share uh, their valuable perspectives and insights uh, with us today. Uh, but before we move on to the very first session, I'm very pleased to have Professor uh, Yeo Sun Yoon, Dean of KAIST College of Business. Uh, she's here for a welcome speech, and I'm sure she will give us a very, very important message for us. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone and express my sincere appreciation to all of you who helped us make this event come together to become a success. And a special thanks to Professor Chang, uh, Sang Chan Park, who organized this event perfectly. And also special thanks to Professor Sung Yun Lee, who will give us a keynote speech. The sixth uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change report said that we have uh, only 30 months to minimize the damaging effect of global warming. Greenhouse gases, deforestation, population, uh, pollution, and uh, carbon emissions are the main reasons for global warming and uh, climate change. We need to reduce greenhouse gas emission by 2025 at the latest to meet the global warming limit. We even don't have to mention the laws and the regulations. We realize the need for sustainable growth is already intertwined with the numerous pain points and the challenges we encounter in our daily lives. So we cannot delay the take actions right now. We must find ways for human development to coexist harmoniously with the environment and the ecosystem we all live in. Also, it is time for us to focus on the huge impact that can be brought by different genders, races, minority groups, etc. Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, said people with disabilities represent one of the world's largest untapped talented people, and we need to create the inclusive workplace that nurtures this talent. It is worth noting that a female scientist, Eunice Newton Foote, was the first to discover the possibility of the greenhouse effect. Yet, regrettably, we have played this lopsided game for far too long, neglecting the socially and or geographically disadvantaged. Recent research by Professor Sante Kim, who is with us today, showed that local venture deeply generate the distinctive and sustainable contribution to the local communities. So I'm sure he will share more about his findings this afternoon. In sum, we are at a critical junction in our journey toward the sustainable development. Sustainable, uh, sustainable development is not a digital idea, but a fundamental necessity that permeates every aspect of our lives. Let us embark this journey together, recognizing the importance of a clean environment, inclusive social progress, and the power of local engagement. The time to get engaged is now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Yoon, uh, Dean of Christ College of Business, for memorable welcome remarks. Uh, now, uh, let me uh, give you a quick overview of the conference today. Uh, we'll begin with a keynote speech, followed by three main sessions. All session chairs are Christ faculty members. Uh, Professor Chu Hun Han will be in charge of the first session, Research on Entrepreneurship Under Adversity. Professor Jin Su Han will serve as session chair of the second session, 
uh, where we'll discuss uh, important issues of sustainability and entrepreneurship. Professor Yoon Seok Pak uh, will be session chair of the third session, research on gender and entrepreneurship. And session four is a special one uh, where we can hear the voice from the young and from the world. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pyong Il Chang from Green Idol Lab will lead exciting panel uh, discussion for us. Now, let's move on to the keynote speech. Um, it's my great pleasure and privilege to uh, have Professor Sun Hyun Lee here as a keynote speaker for this conference. So Professor Lee is a professor at the Jindal School of uh, Management, University of Texas at Dallas. He received his PhD in strategic management and international business from the Ohio State University. Uh, his research focuses on interesting and important topics uh, regarding international entrepreneurship, uh, initial public offerings, um, institutional voids, and most interestingly from uh, my perspective, the dark side of a Greek uh, government and uh, business relations such as bribery and tax evasion. Uh, you can easily find his studies in top journals like um, Organization Science, Strategic Management Journal, uh, Academy of Management Review, and many more. So today, Professor Lee will give a presentation with a very interesting title, One Odd Way to Promote Entrepreneurship and Sustainability. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor Lee with a warm round of applause. Thanks so much for the overwhelming introduction. And, and like as introduced, it is actually the uh, very odd, you know, to have a title like this in you know, one odd way to promote entrepreneurship and sustainability. So I want to be a little bit provocative today and then think about, you know, there are many different ways that, you know, promote entrepreneurship and at the same time sustainability. But is, it, is there a way that is neglected in a way, but at the same time pretty odd because it doesn't seem like promoting entrepreneurship. However, if it does, how it does? How does it do? So that's the, the, the main concern, or like the main point that I wanna make for, you know, in my keynote speech. So there are many ways to promote entrepreneurship. Actually, it, it is well studied at the same time when it comes to practitioners, these are pretty much the things that you know, people count. So such as like give access to financial support. Of course, it's very, very important to do that. And many companies, entrepreneurs, they benefit from the access to financial support and differential support as well. At the same time, a lot of like, entrepreneurs, when I talk to them, they say, so many red tapes, and I, I cannot do anything because of all these rules and regulations. And you know, that the eliminating some red tapes and, and lowering you know, those barriers, of course, helps. But at the same time, you know, there are many other ways, such as like providing education, training, all these things, including all, all, pro, pro, all like you know, that the, in addition, such as like, you know, tax incentives, and you know, that the rural law, you know, that the that kind of literature to talk about, simplify startup process. Great. The thing is, is there anything else? So that's great, but still a lot of firms fail at the same time. A lot of firms, you know, they or a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, they engage in entrepreneurship, but are they really successful? And is there any other way? So is there any way that the very important, but at the same time, kind of neglected? So that the, this was part of my career that I looked into, this like, you know, that the, this avenue, at the same time, the literature talks about this, and that is actually pretty odd and pretty, and pretty provocative. So can you actually help in failing? I know it's pretty odd, like, okay, so you talk about entrepreneurship, talk about like prospering, and all of a sudden you have to talk about failing. So, you know, let, let me, you know, let me like know that they get my the point across the room here. So the thing is, firms fail, always fail. Entrepreneurs, they actually seek risk. And it's like inevitable, because if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to find opportunities that is not seen in, in the past. In many cases, those are not actually tried before. If that is the case, 
it is inevitable to fail. And the thing is, if failing is costly, what happens then? If failing is costly, the thing is, if exit barrier is high, that translates into entry barrier. So people, when they look at, oh, is this going to be a consequence of failure, and there's high, like, you know, that the probability of failing, then why should I start a business? If that's the case, making it easy to fail actually can promote people, entrepreneurs, to engage in risky entrepreneurial endeavor. Of course, as I said, there are many different ways. However, at the same time, this is one very important but very much neglected. Because when I, especially that when I came to Korea and then given that the topic I want to talk about, I talked to many people and looked around and looked at different like you know, TV advertisements and you know, things like on, on subways and everything. It's more like, you know, that the, I'm going to help, the, help, help you this way, help that way. And many of them is promoting different ways. But I've never seen like anything about make them like easy to fail. But it's very important. Why is that? Let's take a look. When it comes to, you know, that the one like, thing we can look at is stringent bankruptcy laws. If it's very hard to go bankrupt, if it's very hard to fail, then the thing is that the anticipation of this high cost in case of bankruptcy or fail deters entry, as I talked about, and self-employment. And at the same time, it's not just about, like, you know, they deter entry, even though, even if a person or entrepreneur enter into entrepreneurship, they won't be seeking risk. So actually, the high exit barriers actually decrease the level of risk taken at the exception. So if you lower that, the exit barrier, actually risk taken will be higher. So the thing is, like on average in the United States, about 90% of entrepreneurs fail. That's inevitable. And if you try to keep it up to make it like, you know, 50% to survive, that means about 40% that should have gone out of business are staying. So is, is it a good thing? Because you know, those resources that could be used for better purposes are staying or stagnant at certain firms. So that is very painful to fail. And it's very painful, especially for when it comes to entrepreneurs. But when it comes to like we level up a little bit, look at the society as a whole, actually it can benefit a lot from failures. That's what it is. So at the same time, that it is not just about all these like legal like or that the formal institutions, informally the problem is failure, especially in a society where the exit barrier is very high, actually stigma is pretty high, attached to bankruptcy. So for example, Korea is one, but you know, when you look at the, you know, our neighbor country in Japan, that even, even recently that many people actually take their lives when they fail their business. That's the stigma attached to bankruptcy, stigma attached to failure. So lowering this, this like stigma actually will promote people, will encourage people to enter into entrepreneurship. That is the basis. Then what's the rationale from the academia standpoint for making failure that's painful? So at the different people, there were different scholars talked about this and Rita Makras, which is one of those like the leaders when it comes to looking into failure, she says that what she argues that the key issue is not avoiding failure. That's not the issue. The issue is actually managing the cost of failure. So making it easy to fail, which means like making it less costly by limiting exposure to downside, which is like that the exposure to, to, to bankruptcy, high like cost bankruptcy, while preserving access to attractive opportunities and maximizing gains. When like, you know, the downside is minimized, there's upside gain. So because people want to get into entrepreneurship and, and entrepreneurship is risky, like, you know, that the endeavor, and that'll actually like, you know, increase the upside. That's our argument. At the same time, economists, you know, they cannot, you know, that the, you know, avoid talking about this as well. And then Nikhil, for example, he says that perhaps competition works not by forcing efficiency on individual firms, but by letting many flowers bloom and, ins and ensuring only the best survive. So the ones that are more capable, more likely to survive, should survive those ones that they should not, may, may not have to, have to survive to make sure those resources are transformed into other businesses and used for better purposes. At the same time, this is one of the works I've done, and then it is about encouraging economic and competitive variety and add value to society. When more people get into business, those who are not going to join 
But because of decrease of this exit barrier, if they join, actually they increase differences. They increase variety. So those ways that was that would not have been tried will be tried by those people entering into businesses. So this is the premise when it comes to making it less painful. So let's take a little more about the upsides. So failure. Failing itself actually has a lot of implications. One is if a firm that should have failed fails, then it actually eliminates the practice that the, the, the practice you know that leads to to failure. That's that's a good thing. So for the Fulcom firm that failed, that is eliminated. So the Fulcom firm by by going bankrupt or like by failing, actually that practice is not pursued anymore which is like an inefficient way of doing business when it comes to, to that business. At the same time, it is not just a full-cup firm. Other firms, they learn what not to do. At least you learn one way that doesn't work from the bystander standpoint. If that's the case, they find ways not to fail. That actually, at the collect collectively, societal level, transforms the population level. It can be the industry at the same time, society in, 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 or, or country. So, let me give you an example. Uber is a good example. Not because Uber is successful, but Uber is actually not the first ride-sharing company. Well, people are like, oh, really? I thought Uber is the first one. Actually, it is not. Actually, the first like, company that started ride-sharing, of course, you know, it went bankrupt. It failed. So nobody remembers, pretty much. And the name was very lame. The name of the company was actually Sidecar. I know, what a lame name. You know, not because of the lame name, they failed, but still they failed. But anyway, the name was very lame, a sidecar. That was the first endeavor when it comes to ride sharing. And that company failed. And eventually that company like, you know, got acquired by GM, General Motors. So it's still surviving when it comes to technology. But the technology itself was, actually the company was, you know, VC backed and everything, got funding and everything, but still they failed. So it's not like it was totally like irrelevant technology. It was relevant, it was the first like initiating firm, but failed because like it's very risky. And Uber learned from that and said like, you know, we'll do this, do that and become, you know, the icon when it comes to ride sharing, you know, company. So we all kind of, kind of like, you know, naively like, you know, that they believe that Uber is the first company when it comes to ride sharing and which is not. And the thing is that not only like that, the, that company went bankrupt and one way of not, should not be doing business and it's gone, at the same time Uber learned what to do, at the population level, it totally changed because we have so many companies that actually entered into this business. At the same time, we do find that taxi industry is changing. So many taxi drivers are gone out of the business as well, but many taxi companies changing their services into much more upgraded level and finding ways to survive. So like giving like a better service and everything. So we do find there's huge change and entrepreneur opportunities like that they're taking place after this kind of endeavor. So actually failure is actually helping a lot. So when you look at it from the population level, it helps a lot. Now, the thing is, okay, so what does it have to do when it comes to sustainability? So with this conference is about the entrepreneurship and sustainability. So looking at this from those sustainable entrepreneurship, those entrepreneurs actually geared toward sustainability. So those are the ones among those entrepreneurs that focus on sustainability. So that, you know, in a simple way, we can look at it this way. You know, too extreme, of course. One way, one is like, you know, just pursuing financial success. Of course, it's very important. You know, that's like one, one most important, like, you know, purpose for businesses because, you know, they are there to make money. That's what it is. We cannot blame that because, you know, that's, you know, that's a good thing to do as well. But at the same time, when it comes to pursuing dual purposes, financial success, at the same time pursuing their cause, which is sustainability. But if you narrow down like your purpose into very narrow area that overlaps between the two when it comes to financial success and environmental sustainability, like in general, it becomes much more risky to do so. So these are the areas that people are not as much encouraged to jump into because it's very risky. However, if it actually that the get the, the, the risk a little bit lower by making sure that you have low, low exit barrier, it'll actually provide 
higher entry barrier. I mean, that the, the lower entry barrier. If that's the case, actually people take more risk, and that risk, which is more risky endeavor, is financial success plus environmental sustainability. There'd be more people actually entering into that area. So if that's the case, that the actually is not just promoting entrepreneurship at the same time, entrepreneurship with sustainability. So. Now, let's take a look at a little bit more like the differential effects. So in a way, what are the things that we can find more fine-grained like implications? So one is about looking at the capabilities of entrepreneurs. So lowering the exit barrier, does it affect entrepreneurs, all entrepreneurs uniformly, or differentiate it or disproportionately like benefit more of one kind of group over the other? So past studies look at the capabilities of entrepreneurs and how do they differ when it comes to how much you know, they gain from this lowered exit barrier. So people find like, you know, that over and over that there's disproportionately increased high growth venture run by more capable entrepreneurs. So these folks looked at you know, the, the education level and they do find that when it comes to lower like, an exit barrier, those actually are more capable, or like that, they at least like they show more capability in terms of education. Actually, get into entrepreneurship much more than those who are not. And the reason is because these are the ones have many, many more alternatives. They can actually have their own job, not just starting their own business, you know, in different companies, and they are like better fared. At the same time, like they are like valid in many other areas. At the same time, these are the ones that they actually looked at, okay, these are the capable ones. So the thing is, if they fail, the cost of failure, much bigger for these people compared to others. Others like who are not capable in terms of education, for example, that if they fail, people say, okay, you know, he or she was going to fail anyway. But if somebody who has like everything like under their belt and they fail, they're huh, I thought he was good. I thought she was really great. But it was not. So all this, like that, the loss of legitimacy is there. So these are the ones that the, that will be more turning away from and starting their own business. But if you lower exit barrier, these aren't, are the ones benefit disproportionately more than others who are less capable. That's what they find. Why? Because of loss of legitimacy. Because that's huge. Because they have a lot to to lose. A lot more to lose. At the same time, because of that, you know, they feel diminished risk. Oh, now I have less risk because like, you know, that the low X barrier. And this leads actually these firms you know, to enter into high uncertainty area, which includes actually entrepreneurship plus sustainability. So eventually what they find is that the more capable individuals will look at the more likely that they under lenient bankruptcy laws that they, they'll be like, you know, that they'll be like more into sustainable, like you no know, entrepreneurship. So, is it, is it only the, the one kind of differential effect? There are others. So gender effect. So women and men. No, no matter what, we know that they, they are different. Of course, there are individual differences and in everything, but as a group, women and men. So we know a lot of successful, like, like that the women and, and entrepreneurs. However, at the same time, when it comes to the population level, we all, like so many different studies in the past show, women are risk averse compared to men. And that's why people say, or like Charles Carlos find that well, then the women are less likely you know, than men to become entrepreneurs. So which means actually this failure is much more painful for women than men. So if you make it easier to fail, disproportionately will benefit women than men. Because men, men, if men were going to start their business anyway without lowering the risk of exit barrier, they will like there will be not much different between the two. However, when it comes to women, if they see this as an opportunity to actually start their own businesses, then actually this will give benefits, this probably more benefits to women compared to men. So more women actually create sustainability business there. One last thing is that the the making failure less painful that when it comes to new ventures, the thing is, especially when it comes to green, when it comes to sustainability, that incumbents have much fewer incentives to do so compared to those 
new entrants. No, that the, for this study, that the, uh, they, they say it is like Goliath and, and David. David and Goliath. And Goliath, those are very conservative firms, always successful, so they are less likely to take risk. But it is those like new entrepreneurs that will take risk, which means lowering access barrier will encourage more entrepreneurs to get into this business, sustainability business. If that's the case, these are the ones that are actually going to change the world. Because conservative ones, those incumbents, won't be taking as much risk. However, the thing is the impact, spillover effect. So now, you know, they call it rebels, you know, rebels and incumbents. Rebels, you know, those, those babies, those small ones, are the ones that are pioneering. But at the same time, we talked about those differences when it comes to risk they have taken. Entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs who are pursuing sustainability. So much more risk involved. If that's the case, then it's very unfortunate, but most of them fail. Because they're, they're pursuing a very hard goal. Purpose is there. However, it is not, of course, we talked about the benefit of failing, but at the same time, because that the, those that are getting into this industry are taking more risk, risk, reward, kind of like that the, kind of the, 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 the relationship, they will actually will be the ones that actually showing the most rewards. Not just for them, but the societal level. Especially that those entrepreneurs pursuing sustainability, these are not the ones that I just want to benefit out of this and that's it. These are the ones I want to have impact. So they will do our purposes. If these are the ones in the business and successful, these are the ones going to change the industry. So those small babies, if they have become successful because of the lower exit barrier, which will lead to like a you know, lower entry barrier, these are the ones that will be very successful. Most of them fail, but if they, what, a few of them are very successful, they are the ones that change the whole industry. If that's the case, at, at the societal level as a whole, there'll be huge gain, even though that individual failure is so painful. If that's the case, it's not a bad way actually to move into. So the thing is, those successful ones actually spur incumbents, those conservatives, to change. So successful ones will impact others, spillover effect. So the thing is, these, are, these incumbents are less ambitious, of course. They won't be as provocative, as risk-taking as entrepreneurs. However, the, the impact will be there. So the thing is, the good thing is that the Less ambitious, but still, they'll be getting into, into, like, you know, into like, a more sustainability business. At the same time, these are the ones that attain bigger goals. Example, Patagonia. Patagonia, like the, the Ivan, and the, the, the owner, started business to make an impact. He said, I don't care if the business goes, goes away, go bankrupt, because my purpose is to change, change the industry, not to be successful. That was his purpose. You know, he's more extreme. So financial success was not his goal at all. But he, it's more like NGO, his company was, when he was accepted. And still like it is, pretty much, I believe. And the thing is, when they actually that they found out you know, many different ways of doing business more sustainably, what he did was he shared his technology without any cost for others, for free. So this is the new development I had, R&D, invested in everything. This new way to make sure environmentally friendly materials are used, environmentally friendly ways of doing business or, way, or production is, is this way. So come and learn from us without any cost involved. So this Patagonia not only changed those, those other companies who are pursuing those like in a very, very differentiated, very, very like that the, like the expensive clothes and, and, and other equipments, actually Patagonia affected and made sure Walmart change. If Walmart changes, Walmart gets, gets into more environmentally friendly business, that's something. Walmart is known for against like you know, those things because they are like causes everything. EDLP was the motto of, of Walmart. If a company can change Walmart to get into more sustainable business, that's something. Patagonia is the one that did. So, so, so he was much killed cared much less when it comes to failure. So how, how, how does it come? Because that the, the lower cost for him mentally and everything made sure like he gets into. So you know, of course, like he's an odd guy, like that's what I did. But if like at a societal level, if we can lower the exit barrier, actually it'll work in, in, in a similar way to make sure others who didn't have got into the entrepreneurship get into entrepreneurship. 
So now, what's ahead then? So with all these things, what to take away? Take away is that the as a society, like you know, it's, it's like you know, the matter of degree, but all society like you know, have success bias. So if you're not successful, like there's like you know that the stigma attached. So we we try to convey a message that success bias is there. So not get into too much into this, which means that failure is an option. In many cases, we say failure is not an option. Make sure it happens, and failure is not an option. But you know, let's show like it's an option as well. Then academically, that we can look at failure as an independent variable. In many cases, we look at it as a dependent variable, or at best, like as Sean did, like looking at it as control variable. But let's look at it like as an independent variable. If that's the case, we'll find much bigger impact of failure on each firm at the same time at the industry and at the same time at the societal level. And thank you for inviting me and thank you for everything. And hopefully I share a little bit about like, you know, one odd way as an odd scholar. Thanks so much. Uh, please, uh, one more uh, round of applause for Professor Lee. Uh, so from now on, uh, I'm not afraid of a failure anymore. Maybe I could embrace failure uh, as something that could be useful to me. So thank you for a imp very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, now we are moving on to the, uh, our first main session, uh, which will be run by Professor Chu Hun Han. So Professor Han, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Yoon, our dean, and also Professor Park for organizing and supporting this great conference. Uh, I'm truly honored to be part of this conference. And I'll be chairing a session uh, where we'll be talking about uh, entrepreneurship uh, under adversity. And uh, we do have great uh, scholars to talk about this uh, topic as speaker and also as, uh, as a discussant. So the, today's speaker is uh, Professor Sun Tae Kim uh, from Johns Hopkins University, Carey School of Business. Uh, Professor Kim received a PhD in management uh, from University of Michigan. And then um, he, went, he studied his academic career at uh, Boston College. And then he's now uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's a leading scholar on this topic, entrepreneurship and other in uh, special context. And his overall research uh, such a, uh, examine um, when and how a new form of organizing emerge, uh, especially in the context of uh, adversity, uh, such as uh, discrimination and crisis, and you know poverty and, and the like. Uh, he did. Uh, he does conduct lots of interesting studies along this line, and he did uh, publish uh, uh, many important papers in some of our uh, very top journals. Uh, and the speaker will um, spend about thirty minutes of presenting his uh, his research, uh, and then we we will have about fifteen minutes of discussion. And the discussion for today is Professor Sonyan Park uh, from Seoul National University, and he also went to University of Michigan uh, for his PhD. And then he's a former faculty at the uh, University of Southern California. And then he's now at uh, uh, Seoul National University. Uh, Professor Park uh, uh, studies, uh, again, another interesting uh, research, which uh, looks at how organizational leaders uh, interpret and you know, cope with uh, the firm's uh, external environment and how that coping affects the firm's strategy and outcomes. And as you, as you may know, uh, Professor Park is a, a renowned scholar in strategy area. And he's currently a uh, associate editor for strategic management other. So after the 15 minutes of discussion, I'll open up the floor for additional uh, questions and discussion and, and the like. Okay, so with that, let me turn over to the, our speaker, Professor Son Tae Kim. Yes. Hello. Hi, everyone. I, I can see that uh, all of you are looking at very large face of mine. This is quite embarrassing. Um, so uh, let me start the, uh, the presentation as soon as possible. Okay, this is better. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me. This is a great honor to be uh, participating in this very meaningful uh, conference. And today I'll be talking about entrepreneurship for local revitalization. 
I'll be mostly sharing tales from post-industrial Detroit. Uh, it's I have to ask for your understanding. Uh, it's a little dark here. It's uh, 30 minutes past midnight here in Eastern United States. So uh, in my office doesn't have a good lighting. So it's a little dark. Uh, I wanted to ask for your understanding. And I might be a little bit slow in terms of speaking and thinking because I typically am deep in the sleep uh, at, at around this time. Okay, let me start. Oops. So Overview. Um, so what I'm going to present today is an in, uh, based on in-depth qualitative research on two incubators in Detroit. I did ethnography for uh, two, and a uh, two and a half years, and then I did follow-up archival research for the following six years. So it's based on my dissertation research in the University of Michigan, started in 2020 and ended in 2012. Uh, 2012, started in 2012 and ended in 2020. See, uh, it's it's past midnight here. Um, so this talk is based on uh, multiple publications. So there were two academic papers published out of this project, one in ASQ, the other in AMJ, and also two uh, practitioner-oriented articles were published out of this project. So if you have any questions or if you want to know more about uh, this project after the presentation, please feel free to uh, refer to these um, articles. So let me talk about Detroit. So uh, the building that you're looking at right now is Michigan Central Station. It's a, when it was built in 1918, it was one of the, most advanced, most beautiful, highest buildings in the in the country. It's 18th cent, 18th floor building, and it was the the, the famous gateway to industrial hub, uh, industrial Midwest in in Detroit. But this is how it looks right now. As you can see, there's no glasses in the windows. You can actually see through the building from the distance. Uh, the building has been abandoned for a long time. There's no train stopping. And it really symbolizes the decline of the city. Detroit used to be the Silicon Valley in 1920s. It was the uh, epicenter of innovation. You know, it's the place where, you know, mass manufacturing of cars has started. And also it was the place called Arsenal of Democracy because all the ammunitions and weapons and jeeps were, were manufactured in Detroit and shipped to Europe to defeat Nazi Germany. Um, but that glorious history ended around 1950s. Since 1950s, 93% of manufacturing jobs disappeared. Nearly 29% of unemployment rate in the beginning of 20, uh, 2010s and more than a third of residents are living in poverty. The city population decreased by 60% and 25%, a quarter of residential properties are abandoned. So that makes city look like this. There are a lot of abandoned houses, a lot of light issues. And all this decline culminated uh, uh, with the largest mun municipal bankruptcy in 2013, which was when I started uh, my dissertation research. So this problem is because of the historical decline of the automotive industry. Um, you know, uh, when uh, Detroit was in its heyday, uh, it was the uh, epicenter of innovation in automotive, automotive industry. But after, you know, Germany started making cars. Japan started making cars with that, the steep global competition. Uh, many of the automotive firms in Detroit actually moved their plant plants to other places where uh, labor cost is much cheaper. So that led to the historic and chronicle decline of the city. <clears throat> And this problem is not unique to Detroit, actually. And there are a lot of other post-industrial cities in the world. In the United States, you can think of Cleveland, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, 
Baltimore, Maryland, where uh, I am right now, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And these are the places where uh, once, uh, these are all the places that used to be the, the center of industrial um, revolution in, in, in the United States. And they, these cities used to be prospering uh, places. But with the beginning of deindustrialization, now these places are struggling e economically. These places are the places where poverty is concentrated and all the social and, and uh, economic problems persist. And it's not just a problem in the United States. Since uh, the conference is happening right now and in South Korea, there are places, the industrial cities in South Korea, Gaoje, Gumi, Gunsan. These are all the places that used to be the center of industri uh, industrialization in South Korea, but now these cities are experiencing steep decline because of the industrialization. So the problem that Detroit has is shared by many places around the world. And a lot of people started to address these problems with the means of entrepreneurship. Not because these places are particularly good for entrepreneurship, but because entrepreneurship is maybe one of the, perhaps one of the last resorts for these places. Large corporate employers already have already left or they went out of business. So, and, for, and, and, and these places have very weak um, charitable organizations, very weak municipal, municipal government. So which leaves uh, these cities uh, left with um, the only choice of entrepreneurship, trying to start a new business to revitalize themselves. The question is, how can entrepreneurship contribute to revitalizing impoverished loca locales like post-industrial cities? Um, the question is, we know there are successful ways to develop entrepreneurship, but do these ways work for places like Detroit? Um, I addressed this question uh, with uh, qualitative inductive research with processual focus. Um, so uh, for those uh, who are not academics in the, in the audience, I um, try to explain what I do in a more uh, understandable way. So there are three steps in, involved in uh, qualitative inductive research with processual focus. Right now here, as you can see, the hodgepodge of data points. This is the reality. This is the phenomena. This is the raw data that we are looking at. From here, the first step is identifying processual patterns that you can see from the data. And then the next step is making theoretical sense of the patterns that you observed from the data. You iterate between the data and the literature and really trying to make a theoretical sense. What does this mean? I see these patterns from this data. What do they mean in, in terms of theory? Uh, answering these questions is the task for the second step. And the last step, is the outcome of this process. The outcome of, the, this pro of this process is not testing hypothesis as we are uh, uh, more familiar with, um, but the outcome of this process is developing a new perspective, uh, giving the world a new way to, new ways to understand the phenomena so that uh, future researchers can, might be able to develop new hypotheses to test in subsequent research. So that's um, basic uh, kind of rationale and logic of uh, qualitative inductive research. So I'll follow uh, my presentation um, based on uh, these, these three steps of research. So first is identifying processual patterns in data and the data that I looked at was ethnographic data from two business incubators in Detroit. So I tried to extract um, processual patterns from all the observations and interviews that I did in two incubators and tried to identify some patterns. So essentially the stories. 
So I'm going to tell you two stories of two business incubators, very different, those very different business incubators in Detroit. First, let me take you Excel. Excel is a business accelerator. Um, it was affiliated with a large local corporation, and its goal was turning Detroit into next Silicon Valley within 10 years. It started in 2013, so obviously their, their, their goal has not been met yet. Um, they had six months accelerator program for a cohort of uh, four to six businesses, and they had three major business leaders, about 40, uh, and they also had about 40 portfolio startups. So they very um, um, truly followed this business accelerator model that was developed out of Silicon Valley. So Y Combinators and uh, Techstars, these are the uh, famous names um, in the business acceleration industry. And they um, uh, quite, um, <clears throat> um, they followed, they essentially um, followed these uh, successful methods that were developed by um, successful business accelerators. So let me tell you a story of Boutique Buy. Boutique Buy is a venture that was developed out of Excel. And I want to show you how Boutique Buy's business idea evolved over time through their acceleration program, Excel's acceleration program. Boutique Buy, Boutique Buy's owner was Robin. She had a uh, background in, tech, uh, in, in fashion. And she had a really a big heart and she really wanted to help brick and mortar local boutiques, fashion retailers uh, in Detroit. So her business, Boutique Buy, started with three main elements. First, the main customers, the only customers are the brick and mortar local boutiques. So fashion retailers who don't have uh, online presence. For them, she wanted to create online showrooms. Uh, where people can reserve items, fashion items like clothes and shoes, but they could not buy. They had to uh, uh, visit these uh, physical stores to uh, complete the purchasing process. And to assist this process, Robin was also thinking about creating inventory management systems for uh, these brick and mortar uh, local boutiques. This idea um, started to get a huge um, pushback, as you might be able to understand, as you might be able to expect from the idea itself, uh, from the mentors in Excel, such as how likely is it that you'll be ever be able to do this to all the stores nationwide? I can tell you my concern is that human intensive ideas are not scalable. You'll get a lot of questions like this from investors. What do good entrepreneurs do? They pivot following the feedback and the advice. So Robin quickly it expanded the customer to include online fashion boutiques, those fashion retailers that already have online presence. But still, other aspects of the business idea were still getting a lot of challenge from the mentors in Excel. Mentor, mentors in Excel would say, you can do, it, do this in Detroit, but you're not going to do that in Kansas. This is not going to be your primary source of revenue. You have to ask yourself if this, if this is something you can do all over the country, especially they were attacking this uh, inventory management system idea because it was taking quite a lot of time of, uh, uh, of the CEO of the company. So after a little bit of, after weeks of uh, resistance, Robin eventually dropped that idea eventually realized that um, inventory, creating inventory management systems for brick and mortar local boutiques may not be scalable. So with that, um, the business idea quickly shifts towards nationwide fashion boutiques rather than Detroit's brick and mortar local retailers. And as all the entrepreneurs do in the acceleration program, they developed MVP, minimal viable product, and, uh, and, they test, uh, they, and they did beta test. And unfortunately, this online showroom, online reservation idea did not get a lot of traction. 
So the mentors of Excel told Robin, here's my recommendation. Don't pitch for funding yet. I can tell you right now that based on what you have now, we wouldn't invest 100K in your business idea. And Robin reacts quite emotionally. What we have built with the funding we got from Excel was a tool where local retailers can upload their products. To me, that's not false positive. It's real. I came here with a big vision, and then it was broken down to pieces, and I built something for just one piece. But eventually, she changed the idea following the feedback because she didn't want to be the failure. Not getting the funding from the accelerator means failure in this, in this context. So at the end of the acceleration program, uh, Boutique Buy became an e-commerce store targeted for uh, nationwide fashion boutiques. An idea, the idea evolved quite dramatically into a format that can quickly scale nationwide. Other businesses in Excel um, evolved in a very similar way. So all 19 ventures expanded beyond Detroit local market within about a year on average. Expansion led to successful fundraising and successful fund fundraising led to another expansion. So there was this mutual reinforcing cycle between expansion and funding, fundraising. An interesting consequence of that was short local presence in Detroit. These businesses out of these ventures out of Excel had short local presence in Detroit, not just because they were failing, but also because they were successful. The more successful they were, the more likely they were to leave Detroit for more source of investment, for better talent, and for, for better access to knowledge in the industry. All of them lacks in Detroit. So seven years later, um, 15 out of 19 ventures ceased operation in Detroit. Many of them were acquired by large non-local companies or they relocated to entrepreneurship hubs such as Silicon Valley, Seattle, Boston. <clears throat> So at the end of the day, Excel Ventures lacked explosive but short-lived impact. At the peak, 19 venture ventures created 125 local jobs, but as of 2020, remaining firms maintained about 30 local jobs. So it was explosive, but did not last long. And many of the successful firms, Excel, don't, don't get me wrong, Excel created a lot of successful ventures, but they do not exist in Detroit anymore. Now, let me take you to Green. Another incubator, uh, they uh, regarded themselves as alternative business incubator. Um, their mission was achieving sustainable revitalization of Detroit. And they had uh, their incubation process called seed design. Um, they did about five, six months of seed design process for individual startups. They had two main mentors and about they had about 40 businesses in residence. Now, let me take you inside green. Let me take, let me tell you the story of Dog Pound, which was one of the ventures who were incubated out of green. And here, I want you to buckle up because the story that I'll be telling you is a strange story. It's not a typical story that you can hear from entrepreneurship um, uh, context. So uh, Doc Pounds, um, uh, uh, the founder uh, is Adrian. She used to be a, a vet technician. So those, uh, those people who help uh, vets to take care of dogs and cats. She won. She came in. Uh, uh, came into Green with an idea of opening a pet store that sells reclaimed pet products, and also uh, by selling these products, she also wanted to give some advice to the pet owners about how to take care of pets. Their process um, was very weird. They did not start talking about how to, you know, make the idea. Uh, 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 
look good or make the idea likable to investors. But they started internal reflection. They spent weeks of weeks and weeks of time to ask to ask questions uh, to Adrian so that they can find deep root, which is defined as something that stayed with the founder for a long time, which the person is passionate about and has the potential to benefit others. So instead of talking about the market and investors, they were talking about Adrian's past, Adrian's memory of the first pad, Adrian's uh, personal view about pet ownership and, 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 and how to how to maintain, build and maintain relationships with their, with their animal companions. After weeks of reflection, um, they came up with uh, Adrian's deep root, which was her unique personal philosophy around pet ownership. Pets are not, pets are neither properties nor humans, and that humans can relate with animals in a way that appreciates their wild nature. So out of this deep root, there's a radical pivot. So they started with the idea of retail, and now the idea evolved into a service that addresses human and animal, human animal relationship issues. That's uh, what they called seed of her business. And as a as a aside, um, I recently adopted a, a puppy, very obnoxious one, and I'm I'm having a lot of relational problems with this uh, with this dog. And now that I think about this idea, is it was a brilliant business idea. Now with the seed, um, maybe you were thinking that now is the time to think about investors, but the mentors at Green explicitly discouraged entrepreneurs from getting investment because of the point that Professor Lee said earlier in the keynote speech, the cost of failure. They were saying that Silicon Valley has a capacity to withstand that kind of failure rate because those people that are getting laid off from the work have a master's degree in computer science and just go to the next startup. They have a whole ecosystem that is built around that. But in Detroit, when that person fails, they're standing in the soup line trying to get food. There's no next job to jump to. In Detroit, the cost of failure was too high. And the mentors in Green didn't want their entrepreneurs to get themselves under the structure of that um, uh, cycle of fundraising. Instead, they engaged in this alternative resourcing practice or resource, resourcing mode that we later termed local bricolage, reproposing and recombining locally available resources to address locally specific problems and opportunities. How did they do local bricolage? They first started looking for those local actors in Detroit who have, who may uh, suffer from you know, relationship problems between humans and their animal companions, and, and how her agent's seed can help their problems. So they, they discovered that uh, local shelter, shelters were suffering from this huge problem of you know, relinqu relinqu relinquishment, which means those adopted pets are coming back to the shelter. So for them, a dog pound was able to provide a adopt adoption counseling and animal behavior hotline service. For local landlords who are suffering from all these problems of pet-related complaints, um, dog, pound, dog Pound was able to provide animal companion education service. And the city of Detroit was suffering from stray dog epidemic because people were leaving the city and they just, they just, um, uh, they just, uh, left their dogs behind, and these dogs become wild dogs, and these wild dogs were attacking people, attacking pedestrians, attacking kids, and actually there were uh, fatalities because of stray dogs. And Dog, Pound's, Dog Pound was providing service for city of uh, Detroit, uh, educational campaigns and individual consultations to alleviate the city's stray dog epidemic. So this is how 
this is a typical way how venture ideas developed out of green. Understandably, quite naturally, right, none of them expanded beyond Detroit because they were designed to feed the resources that are unique in Detroit. They grew steadily through engaging a series of local partnerships. So there's another cycle of mutual reinforcement. Once they were successful with the uh, local bricolage, that leads to another opportunities for local bricolage. And many of the green ventures grew by engaging in a series of different local bricolages with different local actors. Seven years later, six out of eight businesses still operated in Detroit and they left quite different kind of impact. Um, total 18 jobs were created by these eight businesses and 15 remain as of 2020. It sounds small, it seems small, but if you consider all the new jobs that are created by their partnering organizations, collaborators, local, local collaborators, um, they created more than 250 jobs uh, through the partnership with Green Ventures. And most importantly, these green ventures provided otherwise unavailable solutions to Detroit specific issues. Detroit was suffering from food desert problem, urban blight, stray dog problems, and all these problems could not be addressed because the city government is bankrupt. There's no large corporate employers who can deal with this. And there was very weak uh, infrastructure of charitable nonprofit organizations. So these green ventures were providing solutions that can lead to uh, um, uh, the solutions that would not have been provided by anyone else. So here is one example of another venture in green and, and, and uh, this is how they grew over time. It found uh, it's the name of the venture is Food Lab Detroit. It was founded as an organization to support underprivileged uh, local food entrepreneurs, mostly women, mostly African-American. They started with uh, 15 members. And after the seed design process at Green, they repurposed underutilized kitchens in local churches and daycare centers to provide licensed kitchen space for members. This was their first local bricolage. If you think about underprivileged local food entrepreneurs. They don't have kitchen. They, in order to sell the food, you have to pro produce this food in a licensed kitchen, but they don't have access to that. To solve this problem, Food Lab approached local churches and daycare centers because they have licensed kitchens, but they don't use it all the time. So they were uh, utilizing this underutilized kitchens for their uh, members. And also, these underprivileged local food entrepreneurs don't have access to widespread customers, right? So Food Lab connected with Detroit Eastern Market, which is largest farmer's market in Detroit, and again did another round of local bricolage. So they linked this, their member food entrepreneurs to Detroit Eastern Market so that their food these food entrepreneurs could sell their produce uh, through Detroit Eastern Market. Later, they began collaborating with Detroit's urban farmers to procure fresh local produce. And they, with this work, they started receiving funding from uh, local charitable organizations. And uh, by 2016, the members grew to be more than 200 local food entrepreneurs. And uh, again, 2018, they collaborated with local restaurants and nonprofits to showcase member businesses through creating pop-up stores. And interestingly, Food Lab itself did not expand beyond Detroit, but its model was exported to Australia. And there's actually Food Lab in Sydney that was created after Food Lab Detroit. By 2018, they reached combined revenue of 7.5 million, creating 252 jobs. So this is one, uh, one successful example of ventures in green, and it shows a practical example of how local bricolage can lead to scaling, not scaling up, but scaling deep. So now, what does this all mean? 
I identified some processual patterns by looking at these two incubators and how ventures were developed out of these two incubators. And now it's time to make theoretical sense of these patterns. I focus on this concept of venture growth scale because there were these, these ventures out of Excel and out of Green were growing at a very, very different way. And in, in the existing literature, there's no concept to explain or to describe these two very different ways of growth. So I borrow this concept of scale from ecology. In ecology, scale is defined as spatial and temporal attributes of a biophysical or social process. To explain scale, the concept of scale a little bit more uh, concretely, there are two examples. Left one is tornadoes. Tornadoes are the biophysical process, climate process that have very short, relatively short temporal, uh, temporal scale because uh, tornadoes last about weeks. And um, that also this tornadoes have very small spatial scale. Uh, tornadoes can, uh, at most, it can cover several states. But if you compare that to climate change uh, on the right, it's a process with a very long temporal scale that, that spans centuries. And it's a process that covers the entire globe and very uh, large growth spatial scale. So as I was uh, trying to make theoretical sense of the observation from Excel and Green, I was able to see that uh, this concept of scale can be usefully, uh, uh, can be used to describe the difference between uh, the two, the ventures out of two incubators. So Excel ventures were doing scaling up. Uh, they were growing in broad spatiality and short temporality. They were achieving nationwide expansion within three to five years. But ventures out of green were doing scaling deep. The growth that is that has very narrow spatiality, actually anchored in one city, but has long temporality that exists for a long time and that creates impacts for a longer time. So it shows that we tend to believe that uh, there's one way of uh, one way of success, successful successful growth for entrepreneurs, which is scaling up, quickly scaling uh, to a large. Uh, to a uh, uh, broad uh, spatiality. But um, this conceptualization tells us that there may be multi, scaling up may, might be one particular way of venture growth. Ventures can grow in multiple ways. Um, it can scale up and also it can scale deep. And another important part is what causes this divergence? What causes the, this difference? What we found from the, the data is different resourcing modes, especially, especially in the early stage design process. This shows, this is a graphical illustration of how Excel Ventures grew. It started with venture capital financing. And as they were trying to seek venture capital financing, their business model changed towards universal demands. And there is a mutually reinforcing cycle. And out of that cycle, the Excel ventures were making contributions to broad geographical areas. And as a consequence of it, they were exiting from their impoverished origin. But ventures out of green were showing very different trajectory. They started with the local bricolage, and because they were doing more local bricolage, their business model changed toward progressively changed towards locally specific demands. And again, there's a mutually reinforcing cycle between resourcing and business model change. And as a result, uh, these green ventures were making contributions that, that reverberates throughout the impover impoverished locale. So two important insights from this theorization. First, scale of venture growth process can vary spatially and temporally. Scaling up is a one famous and popular way, but it's not the only way. 
success, successful ventures can be success, ventures can be successful, not achieving, uh, not achieving scaling up, but achieving scaling deep. Another important point is scale of venture growth is shaped by what resourcing mode was employed at the time of business model design. As you can see by uh, from the comparison between the two incubators, it re what really matters is the beginning. From the beginning, unwittingly, we are shaping our business ideas so that they can appeal investors, venture capital investors. And by doing so, we are unwittingly shaping the scale of, uh, of growth of these ventures. When the venture, when the business model design process, the early stage of entrepreneurship starts with uh, different resourcing modes, such as local bricolage, the, the, the resulting business, the resulting venture may, may grow in a very different way, but still successfully. So finally, uh, the new perspective that I hope uh, that hopefully is being developed out of this uh, research. It calls into question um, the prevalent focus on quickly scaling up unicorns. We are obsessed with unicorns and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with unicorns. Unicorns and these scaling up businesses actually created a lot of innovation. They created a lot of jobs. They are literally the engine of successful economy. So I have no problem, no qualm about that. The only issue is when your goal is revitalizing places like Detroit or revitalizing places that are, uh, that are under uh, adversity, you may want to think twice because there's a scale mismatch. The problems in Detroit is temporally long and spatially very narrow. But the impact that is created by scaling up ventures tend to be temporarily short and, and, and spatially very broad. So there's a mismatch. So uh, one conclusion of that, of this, of this, of this argument is that we, need, we may need scale diversity. Scaling up ventures can be complemented by scaling deep ventures, which may eventually bring places to self-reliance. If there are many scaling deep ventures in Detroit or in Gunsan or Goje, and if they can lift these cities into out of poverty and into self-reliance, then scaling up ventures out of Detroit may not may have less incentive to leave the city, may want to stay in the city because the city no longer has this deteriorating uh, problems. And the next uh, new perspective would be uh, revitalizing, uh, revitalize, revitalizing impoverished locales may require different approaches for venture development. Our imagination for venture development is still heavily limited to the Silicon Valley model. And again, there's nothing wrong about it. It's natural. Our imagination is limited to our experience. And we have been experiencing a lot of successful stories out of Silicon Valley and, and that model. But um, after I published this paper in many different outlets, I was getting uh, I was getting approached by a lot of practitioners from Appalachian coal mining uh, communities, from Ireland, from Kansas, from some um, unheard of cities uh, in Europe, and they were all struggling with their local economy, and they tried you know, creating Silicon Valley model, but they all failed and they were hungry and thirsty for, for alternatives. And this leads us to uh, realize that we still need further imagination for alternatives. We still don't, we, we, we know a lot about how to create quickly scaling successful tech ventures, but we may not have as much knowledge about how to create entrepreneurship that can revitalize places that are under adversity, under poverty, under crisis. So with that, I'll end uh, my presentation. I'm sorry if I uh, went a little bit longer than planned, uh, but thank you so much for your uh, attention and uh, I, look, I look forward to getting more questions. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Kim, uh, for presenting the really interesting and insightful study. We'll now have uh, Professor Park discussing this study, and then after that, we'll uh, have some uh, additional Q&A. So. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, can we stretch a bit? You know, you can <laughs> uh, stretch your uh, arms, legs, necks, uh, while Professor Santa Kim is also doing the same uh, at the other end of the globe. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's so nice to see uh, the good old friends, including Sean Hyatt. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Santa Kim. Uh, and Professor Lee, uh, thank you for the wonderful keynote speech. I think I'm invited here not because I'm expert on the topic, <laughs> but because I'm the one who witnessed how Professor Sante Kim uh, has had come up with the idea of this social entrepreneurship. I remember back in 2012 uh, in Michigan, uh, I think I was graduating and Professor Kim was a third year PhD student looking for the dissertation topic. And then uh, he was actually literally commuting to Detroit uh, from Ann Arbor. It's about an hour drive, like twice a week to do the interviews. And then I was asking him, why are you doing this? You know, this, this is an ethnography, you know, we are you know, non-native speakers, you have to write, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then I want to see some change. Okay, some change in academic landscape, uh, some change in social landscape. So I want to do, I want to see this, right? Uh, so I very much, uh, I, uh, I remember I, I was very much impressed by his enthusiasm toward the topic. And I'm very glad to uh, see finally uh, his enthusiasm uh, is now, you know, being flourished, uh, you know? So she's, uh, he's getting a lot of invites from all these cities, right? <laughs> so I'll be quick, and uh, I have only uh, five slides. Uh, so I will briefly go over uh, what I uh, think about the topic and uh, some thoughts about the topic. The case of Korea, right? Uh, so Professor Kim was talking about Gunsan and some of these uh, uh, post-industrial cities. Uh, Goje in Korea, and uh, that map actually shows the, uh, the difficulties all these local cities are experiencing uh, in Korea. That actually shows the, the blue, deep blue ones are the empty houses uh, in the nation. And you can see, as Professor Kim uh, noted, Gunsan, Iri, and the uh, post-industrial cities uh, down under uh, are experiencing some of these uh, difficulties. And then, uh, in fact, government is doing a lot of things. Uh, so the network of this VC funds, as you, we, uh, talk, uh, we heard about these two venture capital firms, right? And then uh, the government is actually doing uh, quite a lot to uh, motivate these VCs and the companies, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, to uh, have some role in revitalizing the cities, okay? And then uh, I, as a you know, uh, diligent discussion. <laughs> I read some of the Professor uh, uh, Kim's uh, prior work. And uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to read this Harvard Business Review piece, uh, which summarizes uh, the, his talk today, how entrepreneurs can revitalize the local communities. And then again, uh, we learned how these two approaches of the scaling deep uh, versus, you know, scaling uh, up actually matters, right, uh, from the perspective of the recipient of the local communities. Uh, but uh, I think Professor Kim has nicely summarized in terms of the match between your uh, goal, okay, uh, in terms of the space and time, right, uh, to your local community and your business purposes. Mm -hmm. And then I was just thinking to myself, you know, so what would be the benefits of entrepreneurship under adversity? Uh, in fact, which was the title of this session, right? And then as a uh, pseudo-sociologist, Sean, people call me like that, you know. I have a degree in uh, strategy and, and, and management, uh, but I took a lot of classes in strat uh, sociology department at the University of Michigan, and people called me, uh, you are a pseudo-sociologist. You know, don't call yourself a sociologist because you never set for sociology qualifying exam, and that is true, okay? But I have my own view of uh, looking at the word, okay? And that consists of two things. One is structure, and the other is agency. What do I mean by that? Well, are you a beer lover? Professor Lee, what beer do you drinks, <laughs> drink <laughs> uh, out of this 19 uh, beers, you know, may I ask? 
as a keynote speaker, you, you have to answer my question, Professor Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Locals. Okay. Uh, so local in Korea means I think height. I don't know. Any experience with local beer, Sean? No. No. What beer do you, uh, you, you don't drink at all? <laughs> Professor Park, can you help me? <laughs> Okay, well, so these are the beers we drink every day, uh, but this uh, is, in fact, my uh, favorite beer, which is titled First Love, okay? And this beer, uh, beer you, can, you cannot buy uh, from the convenience stores uh, because this beer uh, you can only buy from the craft brewery in Songsudong, amazing brewing company. Okay, and that's, that is the best seller there. And, you know, those guys who make beer, they have the naming right, Okay, and I asked uh, the person who made this beer, why did you name uh, this beer First Love? And he answered nicely, you know, that beer, if we taste it, the first taste is sweet and it ends with bitter. Okay, and uh, so that's why, uh, that's why it is called First Love. And uh, scholars, you know, study all these strange things, including beer and innovation in the beer industry. And Professor Glenn Carroll at the Stanford University, you know, so obviously he loves beer. <laughs> and then he asked this question, where does innovation come from in the beer industry? Okay. And then he conceptualized the beer innovation, the space, okay, uh, between the center, is this a center, and the periphery. And then he noted that, so those 12 beers you uh, saw, Height, you know, Heineken, and all these uh, lager-like beers you can, we can buy from everywhere, they are targeted at the center of the, oh, at the center of the, the market, okay? And they are the generalists, and they are the beers we drink every day. And why these generalists are focusing on the mass market, which is the center of the market, he argues that we always observe a periphery which will be occupied by the specialist and entrepreneur firms. And that's where you know, the craft brewery firms uh, can actually produce first love, okay? which is distinct from other beers that are targeted at the center. Okay, so if you are located at the periphery and if you are entrepreneurs, okay, well, be proud of it because you have the structural benefits of coming with better ideas. So that's what I mean by structural benefits. The second one is, you know, as uh, Professor Lee uh, also noted in his uh, speech, Yvonne Schoenard, yes, uh, he is the entrepreneur you know, of the Patagonia. Okay, and I think uh, it is a good exemplar of, you know, the entrepreneur, okay? Uh, but his uh, quote here shows a very interesting uh, attitude uh, to his entrepreneurship. And then he's inviting us, you know, if you want to under uh, understand the entrepreneurship, forget about the MBA students, okay? The moment that when you learn uh, that guy uh, went to Harvard, you, that you have to be suspicious, you know, what did you learn at Harvard, <laughs> okay? Because all the new ideas come from, you know, in this case here, you know, the challengers, okay? And he's arguing here, you have to study the juvenile delinquent, okay? Those, you know, troublemakers at school, they are the, they are the ones who have the agency and the force to change the world, okay? And believe it or not, we do have some academic evidence for this. Okay, uh, so some weird professors here, uh, Mark David Zeidel, Henry Graff, and uh, Dennis Ma, they actually analyzed the panel data of Canada, okay, and they s actually found some evidence that those juvenile delinquents or, you know, uh, the troublemakers at high school, they are more likely to become entrepreneurs and later accounting for, of course, you know, all this, of course, you know, uh, then there might be some selection effect, right? But, you know, the entrepreneur agency, uh, in fact, is the force for successful entrepreneurship as well. Yeah. So again, the structure and agency, structure and agency. Yeah. So coming back, you know, I uh, just thought this is my last slide. I was just thinking to myself, you know, uh, after listening to Professor Kim's uh, talk, would it be a good uh, example of, you know, good, 
uh, entrepreneurship, which uh, try to revitalize the local community. Uh, there is Yongchumun, uh, which is the western gate of Gyeongbok Palace, and I will not call so uh, impoverished uh, city. But still, you know, uh, there was a bookstore called Yongchumun Yeoksa Chekbang. It's the uh, bookstore uh, which focuses on uh, history books. Okay, and I loved, you know, I was really like a good patron uh, of the, the bookstore, but it is gone now. It is gone after the, after the COVID. Uh, they were not able to overcome the difficulties of the, and that makes me feel very, very sad. Okay, so that actually shows uh, that, you know, uh, I think three things. One, I said I believe in the uh, benefits of the structural benefits. It, Occupy the niche, okay, whenever you are interested in particular history books, that's the place you go, not the Gyobomungo, the big book uh, uh, general bookstore, okay, structural benefits, and I know the owner a bit, and she is the expert in, his, uh, in the history materials, okay, but despite that, the fact that the company did not, you know, uh, overcome the challenges of COVID actually shows, you know, the challenges and needs for local support in the community, and also the difficulties of entrepreneurship. Okay, and if I may uh, end the uh, discussion with one word after listening to Professor Kim's uh, wonderful presentation, I was thinking to myself, you know, uh, with uh, the, the, the saying that, you know, you have to think globally, but act locally. Does that make sense? Okay, have to uh, think globally, and that's the value and the uh, entrepreneurial purpose, the social purpose to change the world, and that is more general and global, I think. So you have to think globally, but at the end of the day, if you want to revitalize the community and succeed in the local community, you have to act locally, okay? So think globally and act locally. Uh, that was the one lesson I got from Professor Kim's uh, presentation. And I end with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Park, for the very thoughtful uh, discussion of the study. So quickly, so Professor Kim, do you have any thoughts or reaction to the comments that you just got? If not, uh, I'll just you know uh, take the question from the audience here. So, do you have any quick response to Professor Kim, uh, Professor Park? <laughs> Uh, I really appreciated uh, the connections that he was able to make with uh, all the other uh, phenomena that I was not able to think of. And I, I never realized, and this is unrelated, but I never realized that Sean was actually there. I thought he was going to suffer the same problem with me, but I feel, yeah, I don't know. I feel happy for him. Hey, great. Thank you. So uh, checking the time, I guess we can take one or two questions from the floor. So yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Chimao Xie. I'm Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship at SUNY Korea, uh, here in Korea. Uh, so my question has to do with whether you believe that uh, scaling up and scaling deep are actually mutually exclusive. So I, I was flipping through the, the paper, that uh, your AMJ paper, and it seems like, it seems like you're suggesting that they are. And, and, and so I guess my first question is, are they mutually, mutually exclusive? And then my follow-up question has to do with kind of um, one possible explanation for why they might be mutually exclusive. And that would, that would lie in kind of this idea of strong versus weak ties. And I, I flipped through your manuscript, through your EMJ, like, I, like I said, your AMJ paper, and actually you don't mention strong versus weak ties at all. And I was wondering whether you believe that it might be a reason. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a really, uh, is a very thought provoking question. And I really appreciate that. And first of all, I think of them as, uh, more like mutually exclusive because as you can see from the model, once you get into, uh, one route, it is really difficult to change or shift to, to the other route. Once you start uh, by, you know, start, start growing by uh, uh, securing venture capital investment, the, those investors would not be happy if you suddenly start to uh, do local bricolage and try to scale deep. And they'll, they'll feel betrayed and 
uh, it's not going to end well. And uh, the same goes to a hypothetical case where uh, a venture starts with local bricolage and tries to secure venture capital investment uh, because that venture was already designed to be very locally specific. So it will be very difficult for that firm to be uh, to uh, secure local uh, uh, no, venture capital investment. So that's why uh, I think there's a little bit of path dependent dependency nature there. So that's why I was thinking that uh, like shifting between scaling deep and scaling up might be practically difficult. And I would like to, I would love to learn more about how you see the role of weak tie and strong tie in this uh, distinction of scaling deep and scaling up. So. So the uh, there's a paper I, I I've forgotten exactly which uh, which journal I think it was ETP but there was a there was a quite quite well cited paper um, that looks at internationalization of entrepreneurship and I think that's the title internationalization of entrepreneurship and and it basically refers to the strength of weak ties so the the value of relying on weak ties to kind of spread the message of the startup uh, around the world and I was wondering whether that you know, so so when I also when I when I looked at when I was thinking about this difference between scaling up versus scaling deep, it seems like there's also a little bit of this exploitation versus exploration flavor as well, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That, I think this is a really fresh connection that uh, you're able to make, and I wasn't uh, thinking about I wasn't seeing my findings through the network perspective, but yeah, I think there is something about uh, the strong ties and weak ties, and uh, that may explain the reason why scaling deep and uh, ventures may be difficult to do scaling up and vice versa. Um, but I, yeah, I'd like to uh, talk more about that. So uh, thank you so much for this fresh perspective. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I guess, Professor Kim, uh, your presentation seems to be very well received, so there seem to be more questions or comments, but in the interest of time, let me conclude the session here. So, so if you have any further questions, you can just directly reach out to Professor Kim uh, through email or what, uh, or so for further discussion and comments. So let's give them another round of you know, enthusiastic uh, applause. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.